Good evening. I would like to first of all welcome you to St. James and thank you for coming out on such an unpleasant evening in a lot of ways. It's getting cold out there. I went out to go check it out and it's, it's not very nice out there, so thank you for being there. Uh, this is the first lecture in the 2020 season of St. James Fire, uh, Fireside Chats. This series of lectures was created as part of St. James' bicentennial celebrations in 2011. Its creator and coordinator since the beginning has been Sue de Lorenzo, who, by the way, during the bicentennial initiated several other amazing projects, including a series of mouse houses. You'll have to ask her about them someday. But that is another story. Sue decided last year that it was time to retire as the coordinator, but we are thankful that these chats continue because they've been such an important part of life in Hyde Park. One thing to know about these lectures is that they are not merely interesting locally, but they are significant globally. From our connections with the founding of our country to memories of old Hyde Park, to slavery in the Hudson Valley, to the river itself and its health, and of course, to President Roosevelt. This series has been, for many, a look into the past which puts the present into perspective and helps clarify a vision for the future. We believe the Fireside Chats are an important fixture, not only in the life of this congregation, but in the life of Hyde Park. And because we feel so strongly about the people of Hyde Park, we want to keep you safe and comfortable. So a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, there are two restrooms in this building, and they are both through this door. So you go in there, there's one here, and the room right here immediately to your right, and then another as you go closer to the end. Two restrooms. There are also two main exits to this building, so in the case of an emergency, you'll want to go to the one closest to you. There's that door there, straight back, or through that way there. Those are the important things, and there's one other very, very important housekeeping item. You might want to take out your cell phones now and silence them. I have been known to silence people's cell phones for them, but I won't do that to you. But still, if you could, that would be very helpful. And now, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Shannon Butler is the historian for the Poughkeepsie Public Libraries, a position created specifically for her. She is also Hyde Park's town historian and in her, tenure, there, uh, in, in her tenure there, she has done much, especially through her use of social media, to raise awareness of the town and its history. And that's particularly true for a younger audience. Shannon was a National Park Ranger for eight years, most of them at the FDR home or at Valkill. So the president and his family are topics she's intimately familiar with. Shannon also regularly gives lectures on regional history and has published multiple papers, as well as a book on local history with another book, I believe, already under contract. At St. James's, we are pleased to claim her as one of our own. As you're aware, the news over the past several years has been rife with stories of opioid addiction, overdose doses, and addiction uh, and death. Often, what starts out as a prescription for pain turns into a full-blown opium addiction. So we all know that opium is a powerful drug affecting lives of countless people. And it's been around a long time. Tonight, Shannon will speak about one well-known family that played a role in the opium trade more than 100 years ago. And so, without further ado, I ask you to welcome Shannon Butler.
Thank you very much for having me here tonight. This is quite an honor. And uh, yes, this, this subject is a rather controversial one, but it's, a, it's an important one. And it's something that a lot of Roosevelt scholars have shied away from. But the history is there, the evidence is there, and it shouldn't be ignored. I took on this project when I was a graduate student at uh, SUNY Albany, and it was my master's thesis. And my working title for this thesis was originally White Rich Dudes and Their Exploitations Abroad. <laughs> uh, I cleaned it up a bit, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> but it's a, it's a particularly relevant uh, subject, and we're, we're going to dive right into it. So FDR was proud of his heritage, both his Roosevelt and his Delano heritage. Uh, he once claimed that uh, what vitality I have is not inherited from the Roosevelt's mind, such as it is, comes from the Delano's. And his mother uh, firmly agreed on that. Uh, <laughs> I love showing this image because it shows you how <laughs> exactly alike these two are. Uh, their, their chins, their noses, their jaw lines, their eyes, even the gaps in their teeth and the smile there, absolutely 100% alike. And Sarah used to say that her, her son was, quote, a Delano first and a Roosevelt second. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a fascinating family history which goes back over two centuries, and FDR used to love to brag about some of these, these great bits of history that I'm going to share with you. Not, not all of the bits of history he bragged about, mind you. Uh, now, the first of all, the, the Delano's came over pretty early on. They were originally French Huguenots, and they were uh, escaping religious prosecution that was going on in France. They ended up in the Netherlands, like many pilgrims did. And the first Delano to come over here was Philippe Delano. And he came over not on the Mayflower. Actually, his uncle came over on the Mayflower, Francis Cook. He actually came over on the second ship, the Fortune to land in Plymouth Colony, and that's all the way back in 1621. And right from the beginning, Philip shows his interest in making money and prospering. It's, it's kind of ironic that he comes over on a boat named the Fortune. That's kind of foretelling the future for these guys. Um, as soon as he arrives, he, he becomes involved in some of, some of the various campaigns against Native Americans. And then he also will actually have the first recorded land sale in this country's history in 1627, when he sold some land of his. So right from the beginning, the, the Delanos are showing their interest in making some wealth. Now, the, uh, the first Delano to really uh, become a, a merchant sailor is Ephraim Delano. And he will actually, at the age of 25, uh, purchase uh, one sixth part of a little sloop named the Hannah uh, for 18 pounds. And this is in 1758. And immediately he starts venturing into the, the, the trade between New Bedford, Massachusetts, and taking goods down to North Carolina. So he's making his way along the colonies here, along the coastline. Uh, so after a while, some of his notes end up in the Presidential Library Museum. This very delicate, neat little book is in the Delano family papers uh, at FDR here in High Park. And it's a very, very interesting piece of of fabric with, with an odd figure painted on the cover. It's his little book that he's put together for himself. And in it, he's talking about his travels on the Penelope in 1760. Uh, and he's doing quite well for himself. He's bringing corn and wheat um, uh, down the coast, like I was mentioning before. And he's, he's captaining these ships himself. And in this book, he actually writes down uh, his, what materials he's trading, uh, the weather for each day he's sailing, the, the wind, and so forth. And during the American, American Revolution, that, that didn't slow him down. He actually uh, went ahead and commissioned the very first uh, ship of his own, a construction of a ship, right in smack dab in the middle of the war. So that's, that's not letting, slowing him down at all. After the war, in the New Republic here, the Delanos settled uh, in New Bedford, Actually, to be specific, they settled across the river. This is the port uh, of New Bedford here. And they settled across the river from it in Fairhaven. And uh, by the way, if you, how many of you have been to the New Bedford Whaling Museum? Aha, a couple, right? Fabulous museum, uh, for those of you who are into maritime history. 
Um, this uh, museum actually has one of the largest model ships in the world. You can actually walk on it. It's very cool. And they also have a fabulous collection of uh, folk art, Scrimshaw folk art, which is very detailed and, and beautiful stuff. And for the true geek like myself, they have a fabulous archive with lots of Delano family papers. So I had a lot of fun going through their, their documents in New Bedford. Uh, this image here is actually from right about the 1860s, shows you the port of New Bedford. Now, this is the captain, as they called him. Uh, his name is Warren Delano I. He is the youngest son of Ephraim Delano, and he studied navigation very early on. He was uh, quite young. He was, in 1802, he took command of the Augusta, and he was taking cotton uh, from, New uh, from New Orleans up to the New, Bed New Bedford area. Uh, he eventually would earn the name the captain, and that, would, that nickname would stick with him for the rest of his life, which is helpful because there's a lot of Warren Delano's in this family. So it's nice to just be able to refer to him as the captain, and you know who he is. Uh, he is the first of the merchant sailors of the Delano family to make his way overseas to England. So he makes his way overseas and starts trade with Great Britain, and it's a very brave thing to do, particularly as the War of 1812 breaks out. Um, brave or dumb, depending on who you talk to. He would quickly realize his mistake when he was captured by the British, not once, but twice. Uh, he, his entire crew, his cargo, and both of his two ships of his were taken a prize by the British. He ended up spending time on two different prisoner of war ships. That's a nasty way to spend a weekend. Uh, <laughs> and so after that happening twice, and I mean, we're talking losing a lot of money. When you lose a ship and cargo and men, that's a, that's a killing right there. So he lost it twice and he decided that's it. I'm not going to be a captain anymore. I'm going to go be a land lover from now on. So that's essentially what he did. And his sons would kind of follow in that suit. This, this is the, the one guy we're going to spend the most time talking about. This is Warren's eldest son, Warren Jr. And he is the opium dealer, which we're going to get into in a second. Um, he actually is one of many sons that Warren has. You've got Warren Jr., you've got Frederick, you've got Franklin, and you've got Edward. Now, he, from a very young age, will show an interest in business and sailing, though he'll never be a captain like his father was. They'll never be another captain. They'll own ships. They'll certainly get on a ship and go to their various places, but they won't captain a ship quite like uh, Warren and Ephraim had. Uh, at the age of uh, 15, Warren will start working as an apprentice in a firm in Boston uh, called Hathaway & Co. And it's there where he starts learning the business of being a merchant sailor. Uh, his brother, his little brother Frederick, will come along with him and also learn this. Uh, he also will learn how to sail from a cousin of his, Joshua Delano, who was another sort of captain on the seas like Warren. Uh, he actually would head, out, head down to New York City and serve in uh, Goodhue and Company, and that's where he starts to get the idea that he should go to China. He's 23 years old, and he sails for China. And this is 1833. Now, by the time Warren gets to China, the China trade is already well developed. It's nothing new. He will come into a world that's flourishing with trade. This is Canton. And in Canton, this particular area here was known as the 13 factories. And this is pretty much the only part of China that foreigners were allowed in. And it was really no bigger than 15 acres. And you're not just talking Americans. The British are here, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch. The, they're all hanging out doing trade. When he gets there, America has a very small niche in the opium market, but not the good Indian opium. No, nope, that belongs to the British. Americans found a small niche in the Turkish opium market. They'd sail to Turkey, pick up supplies, and then make their way to China and sell it in. Uh, apparently, Turkish opium was not as good quality as Indian opium. And no, I didn't do the research, the taste tests, to determine whether or not that's true. Uh, and I'm just assuming that that's, that's how it was. In 1833, Americans had brought in three times the amount of chests of Turkish opium that they had in previous years. Fortunes were made easily and quickly. 
and, Wa and Warren was well aware of this. He would enter into a small American firm called Russell Sturges & Co. And life in, in, in the 13 factories was a, a close-knit world. Nobody spoke Mandarin. Foreigners were not allowed to learn the language. Uh, if any uh, Chinese individuals were caught teaching foreigners Mandarin, they could be sent to jail or even executed. So the language, the, the, the conversations that were going on between Chinese merchants and foreigners was sort of a, a rough sort of combination of English and various other things. Um, so when he gets there, the, the 13 factories are set up in these narrow blocks of buildings. And this is another view here. You can see that each country is set up with their flag out front of their building. Um, there are, each, each row is about 300 feet back from the edge of the Pearl River. And it goes back, they have little gardens and little paths and little narrow streets that go between each building. And you have hundreds and thousands of people living in this small space. It's a very tight world. The servants, that were inside these factory buildings making life uh, more comfortable for the, the people working there were all Chinese and they were all hired in by these Hong merchants. Hong merchants were these uh, Chinese merchants who were dealing with the foreigners and they made a lot of money. Um, they also broke a lot of the laws that the Chinese government was, was trying to see to, like stopping the opium trade. Uh, but it was, it was an interesting world to be living in, a little cramped. This is kind of neat. The Americans decided that they needed their own private garden. So this is the American garden and paths. They started putting up these, these fences to kind of keep everybody else out. And it was really amusing because you'd have American businessmen sort of walking along in the gardens here while all of the, the Chinese residents of the area were kind of staring in at them, looking at them like going, look at all these strange people in this cage. Why are they spending all their time here? Uh, but this is where the, uh, Warren would spend a good deal of his time taking a nice stroll after a long day's work. Uh, which is, uh, at later on, I think about 1847, uh, missionaries came in and also built a, a big Anglican church right in the middle of it too, so then they were bringing religion over here as well. This is one of the alleyways. This is New China Street, dead center in the middle of Canton. And what you have is you've got a, a couple of uh, uh, small, small uh, rows of, of shops, Chinese shops, on the left and on the right. And th they, were, they were very narrow, and then on, on the other sides of that you had the factories. I think in, in this case, behind this row of buildings, you've got the Danish factory, and on the other side you have the Switzerland factory, all doing their thing. And this is where you'd come to buy your knickknacks and your needs to get through the day. Now, it should be, should be noted that the foreigners that were coming into this, this area were, were known as foreign devils. That was the nickname that they were tended to be called. And they were right to be called that because the Chinese had, every, had good reason to consider these guys evil because of what they were bringing in to their country, which was opium. An extremely addictive drug, as we know, and it was affecting every part of Chinese society. The rich, the poor, royalty, everybody was doing it and it was, it was killing people left and right. The Chinese didn't need anything from anybody. They were a self-sustainable country. They had all their own goods. They needed absolutely nothing. Foreigners coming into this country needed to find something to trade with them, and it was opium. So it was, it was a very desirable, very addictive substance, and that's, that's how most of the money was made. Now, What's going on here is the Americans, the British, they're, they're buying up this opium, they're bringing it up the Pearl River, selling it to these merchants who come in on these junks, they sail off the, uh, off the land, inland, they come out to the river, they buy the opium in exchange for silver. The Americans, the British, and so forth take the silver, they continue up the river to Canton, where they take that silver and then buy the things that the rest of the world wants, uh, Chinese tea was incredibly addictive. Later on, Warren would argue that he was just trading one addiction for the other. 
Uh, tea was just as addictive, you know. Uh, I think he's stretching it a bit there. Uh, porcelain was another big thing. Silks were very desirable. And another big market in China at the time were, were reproductions of paintings and prints. There was a huge market for Chinese artists doing these re recreations of old masters and so forth. And Americans were buying that up uh, to, to furnish their homes with. Young traders like Warren spent hours in these tasting rooms. This is a tea tasting room. And he would be tasting and weighing and preparing the shipments of tea to be sent back to the States. Now, Warren was proving himself quite worthy. He spent the first year uh, in China uh, as sort of a clerk in Russell Sturges and Company, and then was quickly made a partner by 1834. He wrote home to a cousin of his saying, my present position is one quite satisfactory to me, and if business flows into our hands like we hope, I shall make a sensible fortune in the course of a few years. He's right, it didn't take him that long at all to make a life's fortune here. In 1838, Warren was fully into his work, and he had a place in life now. He was doing quite well, so he, he wrote home to New York. This is a scene from New York in the 1830s, and he's trying to get the attention of his little brothers to come and join him. One of the things that I see in, in Warren's letters home all the time is that he's always lonely, and he's always aching for family to be with him in China. So he's trying to get his little brother Frederick to come out there, and, and, and Frederick doesn't seem terribly interested, but Warren writes to him saying, I know where you can get ships. I know where you can supply these ships. Get good captains, and then you'll stop in Turkey and pick up a good supply of opium and make your way around the, the, the bottom of Africa and, and come on over to China. It'll be great. And Frederick's like, mm, no, nah, I'm going to pass. Uh, <laughs> Warren was then asked in 1839 to join a much larger firm in China, the largest American firm, in fact, Russell and Co. And the man who asked him to join was this man here, Robert Forbes. Now Forbes is a name that we know is connected with wealth. Forbes magazine, of course, from that very family. Now, the Forbes family were not the only big money-making families involved in this business early on. You also have John Jacob Astor of Rhinebeck. You also have uh, Stephen Gerard of Philadelphia and Elias Derby of Salem, Massachusetts. There's a lot of big, big money-making names out in this neck of the world uh, making their wealth. Here we have an image from 1850 of uh, an opium drying uh, facility in India. And essentially what you have is that they would take the opium and roll it into balls and then they place it on these shelves for, for a drying period before putting it in chests and then shipping it off to China. Because you, you can just see the massive quantity of just this one particular factory in India where they're doing their thing. Uh, foreign ships, uh, this, this is foreign ships coming into the Pearl River. With more and more merchants from other countries bringing in this, this toxic nightmare, China decided to take action. Now there, there had been commissioners sent in to try to stop the opium business, but they were all uh, corruptible, if you will. They, they were easily paid off by the British, and, and things just continued to move along. Warren wrote home to his brother Franklin saying, appearances indicate a determination on the part of the government to crush the trade entirely. And it's only because of this man here that they succeeded. This is Lin Sei Shu. Lin Sei Shu was a commissioner that was brought in in the 1830s to stop the opium trade, and he was... He was vicious, and he got the job done, rightfully so, of course. Um, it was, it, it, I, I have to sort of make sure one thing's perfectly clear. The opium trade, when I, when I mentioned this when I, back when I was a, tour, uh, a park ranger, and I'd say, oh, the Delanos were involved in the opium trade, well, it's 80% of the visitors would go, oh, well, that was legal. No, it wasn't. A lot of Americans have this misconception that it was totally okay. No, none of it was okay. The British were, the British, Americans, the French, the Dutch, everybody was abusing, exploiting the Chinese, and they would continue to do it for 100 years. It's going to get worse, as we'll see. Now, what happens is the Chinese government brings in Commissioner Lin Zesu, and he finally cracks down hard. 
he first begins by threatening to execute on the spot any opium dealers he catches, which is quite effective. He then punishes all of the foreign, uh, uh, foreign dealers in their factories by removing all of their servants and also start, starting a blockade. There's even mention of him poisoning local wells to stop these people from, from, from living in this area. Actually, Warren writes home about it, saying, you would not believe, they, they took our servant away, so I'm serving as the cook for my whole firm. Uh, I guess they weren't eating terribly well when he was in charge of that. Uh, Commissioner Lin threatened to kill all of the Hans who were doing business. Uh, with these foreign traders, including uh, Warren's good friend, Hagawa, who was one of the major Hongs in the area, probably one of the most wealthy men in all of China. So, finally, June 3rd, 1839, Commissioner Seishu requests a, a all-out surrender of all the opium chests from all these firms. And Warren's firm, they agree. Overall, 21,000 chests of opium were surrendered to Commissioner Lin. And then he goes ahead and holds this public destruction of all of the opium. I, I, I love the look of the one guy in the corner. He's like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was a major, major victory. As a matter of fact, uh, Seishu would, would become a, a hero in China. They actually have holidays for him, of course. And there's a statue of him in Chinatown in New York City. So if you ever hang out in Chinatown and you see the statue of this, this guy, that's him. He was the one fighting the opium trade in China all those over a century ago. Now, the British were, to put it lightly, pissed. Uh, they were super angry with everything that was going on. Uh, these merchants felt that they were, they were out millions, millions of dollars uh, with this whole, this whole thing that Lin was doing. So they demanded retribution. There were letters left and right heading to England, going to Queen Victoria, something must be done about this. <laughs> and, and so the, the British decide, well, if we just pack up shop and leave, we can stop all trade in its place. Well, that didn't work out quite so well because American firms like Warren's happily took up the trade that the British were leaving behind, and the French and the Dutch as well. Now, the British pack up and they leave for the most part, but Americans continue to do quite well. Uh, this is a scene for trade going on in Canton. Now, Americans, of course, had relied mostly on opium, but with that kind of coming to an end, more or less, they turned to another thing that had become, uh, became something that, that particularly northern China was interested in, and that was good old-fashioned American southern cotton. So, they started bringing that in. Warren's main ship, uh, the Linton went from bringing opium up the Pearl River to bringing cotton from the southern states. So they, they did okay, but they weren't making money quite as quickly. Finally, Warren was able to convince one of his brothers to come to China. His youngest brother, Edward Delano, also known as Ned. Ned uh, decides that he's going to make his way over. It's a 20-week trip, by the way. Uh, from New York uh, to China in those days on a, on a good, good, fast clipper ship. Uh, so he gets over there right on time for the first of the opium wars to begin. He gets into China at the worst possible time because the British come back with a vengeance and they bring their navy. And they decide they're going to make the Chinese trade opium, whether they like it or not. The British uh, come in with a, a massive navy and they, they, they block up all the ports. They will completely, there were at least 20 ships, 20 British frigates that made their way up the Pearl River and they just plopped themselves in any place they, they could think of and then they started attacking Chinese forts and, and settlements. And it was very nasty. Uh, Ned, while he, he gets over to China, and he's, he's there for the very first time and he hears of a battle that's taking place. So, of course, Ned is a young man, he wants to check it out. He heads over and he writes in his diary, he keeps beautifully detailed diaries that are all in the Presidential Library Museum. And he writes uh, on, on January 7th, 1841, that he went onto the battlefield after the battle was over, fresh corpses all over. 
He says, I picked up a Chinese powder horn and I cut a button off of a jacket of an English soldier. I mean, this is kind of gross, but he was this young man and this was fascinating to him. But one of the things I got to say about Ned, although sometimes I'm like, dude, what are you doing when I'm reading these diaries? Uh, he does write very beautifully detailed entries. This is a map of the area, and it's kind of kind of hard to see because it's this is kind of a small screen here. But there's there's British ships all the, this, these are these, this is the uh, the river which kind of kind of goes into pieces here. This is Wampua Island. This is another space where they would do some trading. This is Canton right here, the tiny tiny little city of Canton, and there there's ships all over the place. Her Majesty's ships. And then there's battles that happen in various locations and various forts throughout this whole area. And this will continue on for, for quite a while. This is one of Edward's uh, diaries. And he, he's, he's writing about how he's quite furious with the way the British are treating the Chinese. Uh, he does not appreciate it at all. He also notes the fact that sometimes local uh, Chinese merchants and, and servants in the area don't know the difference between an Englishman and an American. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there's some issues there. Uh, his brother uh, is involved in various skirmishes and, and Warren almost gets shot. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very scary time. Warren was fired on by some Chinese who were skirmishing in Canton. They were looking for British, but they, they got Warren instead. They captured him. The commissioner takes Warren to this jail and then he realizes, oh, 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 oh you're American. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. And they put him on a on a chair and they carry him back to his, his factory. And Warren was, was writes in his diary about how silly it was to see his brother coming down a street on a chair on, on people's shoulders. And I'm so terribly sorry about that. Miss, we, we miss, had him in a little mistake there. In August of 1842, the British Navy and our army overpowered uh, the Chinese. Um, the British, of course, had the best tactics, the best weapons. The Chinese had uh, old um, uh, match match, what's those, uh, match stick uh, or match rope muskets. It was terrible. They, they can't, you can't hit the side of a barn or one of those things. They had it bows and arrows and, and sticks, essentially, while the British came in with modern rifles and, and, and well-trained men. So it was, it was a, a slaughter. In one battle alone, this, this is one of the battles of the forts that took place, uh, 500 Chinese soldiers were killed, and I think 38 British soldiers were wounded, uh, and that was it. So it... It was quite unfortunate. Treaty, a, a bunch of talks were put together. A treaty was signed. This allowed the British to gain sovereignty over Hong Kong, uh, opening up more ports for them. It essentially um, ended the ban on opium, and the Chinese were forced to pay the British 20 million pounds in uh, in losses. So it was it was the beginning of what would be essentially a hundred year period of exploitation and humiliation of China. Um, Warren, meanwhile, had been in China for almost 10 years, and he wanted to go home. He wanted to start a family. He's in his early 30s at this point, so he, he heads off. He, he, well, he, first he hums and haws about it. He's not sure if he wants to go. He's making a lot of money. Things are looking up. The war is over. But he's thinking, well, I, sh I should really go. So now that he's got his brother Ned there to oversee things, he finally decides, I'll go home to the States. So Ned... Ned goes ahead and, and starts to take over things, and Ned decides he wants to experience this trade up front, in close and personal for himself. So he, he gets on a ship with some other members of the firm, and he goes to India. Now the firm has connections to the Indian opium, the good stuff, apparently. And he goes over and he decides to, uh, he writes in his diaries, we see in his diaries, he's writing down the qualities, the amounts, uh, they're tripling the amount of opium they were bringing in beforehand, before the war. And then he writes down about some exploits. He, he heads to a, a bazaar in India, and he takes strolls through all these opium dens for the first time. And he writes about the experience. He says, One man was prostrate under its effects, pale, cadaverous, and death-like in appearance. He said that he took the man's pipe out of his hand. He said he offered no resistance, but watched with his eyes as I moved the pipe from side to side. He's writing this stuff down in his diary. He knows what this stuff is doing. And yet, he continues to do his trade, although he will complain about fellow members of the firm working on the Sabbath. That was an issue. 
the opium and the iron, not so much. Now, meanwhile, in America, Warren set himself up quite nicely by marrying a lovely lady named Catherine Lyman. She is from a very prominent Boston family. They get married and very quickly sail back to China. Uh, Warren just can't keep away from the action. So he brings his wife with him, and they will start a family in China. Now, um, um, foreigners, like I said, were only allowed in a small portion of China. Uh, fem um, female foreigners <laughs> were allowed in even a smaller portion of China. Uh, for the most part, uh, women were only allowed on the small island of Macau. And they, the, the, the company that Warren was working for actually built a house there called Arrowdale. It was quite a, a lovely mansion. So she ends up heading over to Arrowdale. She lives happily with Warren there. They have two daughters, Susan in 1844 and, Lu and Louise in 1846. But sadly, Susan dies, right about the time Louise is being born. Warren is terrified of the, the health of his wife and the health of his new baby girl, so he decides that's it. We're done. We're going back home. So the whole family, Warren, Ned, Catherine, and baby Louise, make their way back to the States. This lovely building is Colonnade Row, down in New York City. And this is where the family will settle when they come back. Now, his father, uh, the captain, built a lovely house in Fairhaven in 1832. So there is that house to go back to, but Warren wants to be in the center of things in New York. So Colonnade Row, which was a series of townhouses connected get together by this, this, these lovely columns, had some very famous people in it. The Vanderbilts were living here, the Astors were living here, Washington Irving lived there, uh, and of course, Warren and his family. His brother Franklin had been living there. Franklin Delano married Laura Astor, uh, granddaughter of John Jacob Astor. So uh, they were all kind of living together, one big happily family here. Warren, like many wealthy individuals in New York City, wanted a home on the Hudson. Uh, his brother Franklin had a lovely house uh, north of here, in Barry Town called Steen Vallecci. And uh, if you go to Poet's Walk, and you're walking towards the river, Steen Vallecci's still back there, a heavily altered, but quite a fabulous house. So Warren was asking his brother, could, could you help me find a suitable house on the Hudson like yours? Uh, at first, he started by renting a house uh, in, near Newburgh uh, in 1847. And then he finally found the right place. In 1851, he purchased the Higginson Farm in a small area called Balmville, just north of Newburgh. He hired architects to improve the house and grounds, uh, Andrew Jackson Downing and Calvert Vall. And of course, those names, those names are pretty common in the area. Uh, he would quickly fill the house with glorious pieces from China. Uh, you can see some Chinese vases there, some Chinese um, um, furniture there, and he also had a, a massive portrait of his very dear friend, Hagua, the Chinese Hong that he made his fortune on, uh, hanging above his, his desk in his office. And later on, when the Delanos would, would auction off their, their properties and, and, and holdings, if you look through the auction holdings, it's all Chinese stuff. I mean, tons and tons and tons of Chinese antiques. Now, Kate and Warren would have several more children in this house, including Sarah Delano, who was born here. They had 11 children altogether. Uh, <laughs> they're busy, yeah. Uh, they wrote down every detail of life in little family diaries that they kept. They, we call them the Algonac Diaries today, and they're also at the FDR Library. Uh, the good, the bad, the sad, it's all, it's all in there. Now, Warren uh, kind of stretched himself a bit thin. Uh, when he came back to the States. Uh, this was a guy interested in doing whatever he could do to make money, and he had invested in a lot of things, probably too many things, including mines in Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Maryland. Uh, he, there's a, if you drive through Pennsylvania, you'll find a Delano, Pennsylvania. That's, that's his work. Uh, and then, of course, the Panic of 1857 broke out. So he lost a good chunk of his, his wealth. So he decided to do what he knew the most about the opium trade. He got back into it. He sailed out to China once again in the hopes of making another fortune. 
He's still a member of Russell and Co., so it doesn't take much to get back in there. And he gets back to China just as the second opium war was coming to an end. The 13 factories, the area of Canton that he knew so well, had been burnt to the ground. The American gardens were gone, the Anglican church burnt to the ground too, everything gone. So he's doing a lot of his business in Hong Kong, in Makawa, and he gets over there, he's in there in 1860, he's doing his thing, and then the Civil War breaks out. It's taking him longer to make his fortune because trade's not doing too well during the Civil War. And once again, he's getting lonely as he always does when he's in China. So, he writes home. He writes to his beloved Catherine, and he says, Honey, bring the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, she does. And she will sail the entire family, mostly children, <laughs> on a, a clipper ship called the Surprise. They, they leave New York in June of 1862. Uh, it will take a, a, a very long voyage. They will get there by Halloween of 1862. Uh, <laughs> and while they're out there, she keeps a very detailed diary. I love the Delano's and their details in their diaries. It's very helpful. Uh, the diary, also at the Presidential Library Museum, uh, talks about their, their travels, the, the, the entire time they were on their voyage. And mostly it's people being sick. <laughs> uh, a lot of seasickness. A lot of bad weather, some harsh wind, sometimes no wind. There's a lot of boredom. There's some birthday parties that take place on board, including little Sarah's. Um, it, it, I think she celebrated her birthday uh, on the same day that the captain of the ship, the young 28-year-old Captain Ranlett, so they're having a party. Uh, but Ranlett was, was also very paranoid of pir privateers and, and southern um, uh, uh, privateers coming in and capturing them. Uh, and as a matter of fact, FDR later on claimed that uh, his, his mother was almost attacked by Confederate uh, raiders, which actually never happened. They were nowhere near, nowhere near them. Um, but <laughs> he liked to talk about it quite a, quite a lot. So they finally get to China, the whole family, uh, in October of 1862. And, and life's, life's pretty good. They live in a, a house called Rose Hill. Uh, they have servants, they have a walled-in garden, they have ponies and carriages and tutors, and life is good. They'll have two more kids while they're over there. Uh, Fred and Laura are born in, short, in China. They have tea parties and pony rides and everything. It's, it's, a, it's a good time. Uh, they kept up with the news coming back from the States. Uh, they heard a lot about the war. Uh, and of course, news travels very slowly to China, so the, the first few years of the war was nothing but Union losses. So they were a little nervous over there hearing about all this. And then by, by the time they hear about uh, Gettysburg, it starts to turn around a little bit. But they're, 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 they're getting their gossip, you know, always a few months late, which is, which is rough. This book, I absolutely love. This is, one of those, this is one of my favorite items in the archives, and it's one of those things that we historians have these dreams about. And when you come across it, you're just like trying to hold back the drool. And it's like, oh my goodness, this is exciting. I'm really a, I'm really a nerd, really bad nerd. So this is Warren's ledgers from China. And apparently his little boy, Warren III, got a hold of them. And he takes them and he goes ahead and he, he cuts and pastes all these cool Harper's Ferry and London Illustrated News images inside the ledger and then continues to, to color them in. And then he'll, he'll also throw in his own images of ships and things throughout the book. But if, as, you're, as you're looking at all these great little pieces of art that he's doing, underneath you can see opium, opium, opium. <laughs> it's like, it's all over the place. I'm like, well, that's neat. <laughs> so that was one of those pieces that I, I stumbled upon in the archives that I, I was very, very interested in. So after uh, a few years in China, Kate and Warren decide they're going to send the couple of youngest children back to the States. Now, they had rented out their lovely Newburgh house, Algodoc, so they sent them to the captain's house in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. This is the captain's house right here. Uh, by the way, it is a fabulous bed and breakfast, just so you know. I totally geeked out when I went out there to do research at the New Bedford Railing Museum, stayed in the Delano family home in the Sarah Delano Roosevelt room, totally geeking out. Uh, <laughs> it was very beautiful, and it, it wasn't, wasn't lost on me, that, what was going on. Um, 
So the, the, the youngest kids are sent back. They live with grandpa. And it takes a while, but finally they decided it was time to, to head back. By 1866, the captain has become very ill. So Warren says, all right, we've made our money. The Civil War is over. Let's go back for good. Now he packs up the family with the exception of two of his daughters. Uh, Dora and Annie had married young members of the firm, Russell and Co. So they stayed behind in China. The rest of the family came back. And they stayed with the captain, and he died shortly after their return. So at that point, Warren decides to greatly expand the lovely house in Fairhaven because he's still got people renting his Newburgh estate. And over the next uh, 15 years or so, you'll have Delano's all over the world. The kids will go off to study in Germany. Little Sarah will spend a good deal of her time studying in Germany. Her little brother Warren would also uh, go to Germany as well. They rented apartments in Paris and were, were, were just about all over the place until the renters at Algonac left and they came back. Now, in the 17, oh, sorry, 1870s and 80s, the family was expanding, including the marriages of Warren Delano. Uh, Warren Delano marries Jenny Walters. If you've ever been to Baltimore to see the Walters Art Gallery, uh, that family is, is where Jenny's from. And they live up at, they'll live at Steen Vilecci uh, after Franklin and Laura Astor pass away. And of course, you have the marriage of Sarah Delano to James Roosevelt. And of course, more money comes into the family that way. This is a great photograph of a Delano family reunion taking place at Algonac. And you have Warren, old Warren, sitting there with his huge mutton chops here. Right next to him is his young grandson, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Above Franklin is his father, James Roosevelt. On James's left is Sarah. You have Kate below Sarah, her, her, that's her mother. You've got seven children and eight grandkids all together in this, this lovely image of the Delano family. The portrait all the way over to the right is of Laura Delano. Uh, Laura had died in a freak accident. Uh, she burned to death at Algonac in the process of trying to curl her hair with an old fashioned curling iron. And she knocked over the alcohol lamp beside her and her dress went up in flames. Laura was the youngest of, of the, the, the girls in the family. And that really broke Warren. When he lost his Laura, um, that was kind of the end for him. And she, in, in, portraits of her will appear in a lot of the family photographs later on, and even images of just Warren sitting there by himself. Sometimes he'll have Laura's portrait beside him. The family certainly had plenty of money with all of their work, all their dealings in China. And the money was used in local communities. In 1885, they built a hospital for children in New York City, named after Laura, actually, with their opium money. Sarah, of course, would build the James Roosevelt Memorial Library right here in High Park with her opium money. The churches of High Park would benefit greatly from her money. She would serve on various committees and charity boards and organizations. Sarah's sister, Annie Delano Hitch, she gave a huge chunk of land to the city of Newburgh. You've got Delano Hitch Park. That's all from opium money. So they were certainly contributing to their society around them. This is one of the last photographs taken of Warren Delano, and check out his outfit. Beautiful Chinese robe he's wearing. Now, towards the end of Warren's life, he got a letter from his friend, Robert Forbes, fellow member of the firm, and Forbes wrote to him saying, I'd, I'd like you to contribute to this history that I'm writing of our firm. And Warren, along with pretty much all the other partners, said, mm, no, I'd rather not. Nobody needs to read a history of our firm. It's not that interesting. <laughs> Which is, is very interesting because when he was a young man in China, he wrote home and specifically said, and I quote, that the trade that he was in is a fair, honorable, and legitimate trade and that it is no different than bringing spirits and liquors into the US. <laughs> As an older man, he clearly didn't feel that way. Well, FDR would endeavor, as president, 
to befriend China, and he did. We see him here with Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Madam Chiang Kai-shek, or Su Mei Ling, as she's known, at the Cairo Conference. FDR had said that his family had a long and strong connection to the people of China, and he felt that it was his duty to continue that relationship. Now, he didn't exactly clarify <laughs> his family's connection to China. Roosevelt was attacked, um, actually by a journalist named Westbrook Pedgler, who stated that FDR was only wealthy thanks to his mother's opium money. Eleanor defended uh, her husband. She stated in one of her My Day columns, she said, Warren Delano had been in the China trade, but he dealt only in tea. She kind of missed the whole point. Mrs. Roosevelt wanted to visit China, but she was denied entry. The State Department said it was too dangerous, and Mao Zedong said, we don't like you, Mrs. Roosevelt. You're not coming in here. Now, Daniel Delano, uh, a distant admiring cousin of FDR's, wrote a book in 1946, just after FDR died, and the title of the book was Franklin, Delano and, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the Delano Influence. And in the book, he claimed that Warren was in the opium trade but only during the Civil War, and only to bring the drug to the States as a medicine to help wounded Union soldiers. <laughs> well, I searched in vain for proof of that. No, <laughs> not true. And he completely ignored the fact that Warren had been there long before the Civil War. Author uh, Michael Teague was interviewing Alice Roosevelt in the 1970s, FDR's infamous Oyster Bay cousin. She's, of course, the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt and was known for causing trouble between the High Park and the Oyster Bay branches. She had a, a wit, a sharp tongue. So during the interview, this author, Mr. Teague, explained to her how he was also researching Warren Delano and his clipper ships in China. And Alice, I love this, Alice, with her famous wit, says, Oh, do let me know if you discover whether he had dealings in the opium trade, because you see, that would make Franklin a criminal. <laughs> uh, of course, by the 1970s, it didn't really matter. Anyway, it's a fascinating history. And this is just sort of a, a short kind of telling of that history. There's, there's much more to it. But I'm, I wanted to share it with you. And, and, um, and, I, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. If you do have questions, we have a volunteer with a microphone, so we'll ask that you raise your hand and then wait for him to get to you so people can hear you. Did any of the Delanos have addiction problems themselves? Oh, no. <laughs> they didn't touch the stuff. Uh, no. Uh, they were well aware of what it could do. <laughs> um, when I was reading through Edward's diaries, actually, I came across uh, some nights where it was just a boring, hot night, and he was sitting with his, members of his firm in the factory, and, and he said how they were smoking fine cigars and, and drinking brandy. But, and I, when I first saw they're smoking, I was like, ooh! I'm like, oh, no, it's just cigars. All right. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe, but no, it doesn't appear that they ever touch the stuff. Which is, you know, it's kind of interesting when you see how the tides have turned. China doesn't have an opioid crisis. There are no opioid problems in China at all. But we've got it, which is quite interesting. Uh, oh, question over there. This is actually not a question, it's an observation. Uh, Chinese fentanyl, which is an opiate, is, uh, is plaguing the streets and, and communities of the United States right now. Oh, yeah. So what comes around goes around. Exactly. Oh, question all the way in the back. Go, Stephen, go. I'm <laughs> confused a wee bit. When uh, Warren picked up the um, opium from Turkey, and India, did they buy it on credit or did they have cash or something to give them? 
I think there was much more of a desire to trade with Turkey. Turkey was, was actually picking up on some of the cotton and things that the that Americans had, as well as furs. Furs were a big thing. Uh, but of course, that, that would fizzle out over time. And then by the time they had gotten enough of their, their opium and enough silver and the ball got rolling, it was, it was a matter of just trading silver for, for opium uh, with Turkey and, and India. Uh, for the British, it was much easier because the British owned India. That was their supply. They didn't have to worry about anything. They just went in, picked up their shipment, and headed to China. So it was a, a bit more expensive for Americans and, and other foreign dealers to, to get buy up the Indian and, and Turkish opium. And I think, I think the British even made a profit um, on, on traders like Americans and, and, uh, and the Dutch and so forth on, on that score. China get involved if the opium's in India and Turkey, why go to China? Why not just get it from the Well, the Chinese didn't want any of this stuff. They didn't. They were a self-sustainable country. They had no interest in any of this. They were trying to block off all trade entirely. But the British and other countries forced themselves in. And when they really when they got there and realized, oh, the Chinese don't need anything, then they discovered they liked opium that's when they really found their market. Because the opium, they were bringing, selling the opium into China, and that was the only thing the Chinese were interested in buying. Well, they were and they weren't. <laughs> um, these, these, these Hongs were interested in buying. And it was, it was, it was really damaging, and, and the, the Chinese, they saw this as a, as a huge issue and, and, and started to fight it, but it, sadly, they were overrun by the stronger and, and more powerful military power of, of, of Great Britain. Well, another question over there. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you knew much about the um, the role of Yale and uh, Skull and Bones and the people that founded that and the opium trade. No, no, I don't. Okay. No, I just looked at the Delanos. <laughs> oh, there's another question over there. Man, you should have worn your Fitbit, man. <laughs> Yeah, put it right up close there. I was just curious about the Hongs. Mm -hmm. Of the Hongs, the beginning of Hong Kong? Uh, uh, that I don't know. Um, the, the Hongs were just mer major merchants in China. Um, that was the, they were actually called the Kohong. And they were guys like Hagua and Magua. Uh, they, these were, I mean, men who were worth more than even the the emperor of China from their dealings with, with foreign uh, dealers. But I don't know if there's any connection between the word Hong and Hong Kong. It, it wasn't in the same part geographically? Well, the, the Hongs were all over the place. They, oh, yeah. Oh, I see. So, okay. it, I mean, they, their, their main center of business was in Canton, but that's, that's only because that's where the, the, the foreigners were allowed oh, until the British took over Hong Kong and then they were able to go in there. But I don't know if there's a connection between the name of Hong Kong and the, the names of the, these merchants. It's a good, really good question, actually. Uh, that, yes. Thank you <laughs> Mr. very Golden. much for a wonderful lesson in history. Oh, oh my pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Before you, before you start moving, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you again to Shannon because it's wonderful and, and amazing information. But there are some other thank yous that we need to extend, and I, and I hope you will. Uh, first and foremost, I think, to Sue DeLorenzo for creating this entire event, for her vision, which has made these lectures possible for 10 years now. Uh, this is our 10th year of doing it, so we're, we're delighted for that. Uh, yay, yay, Sue. Yay, And I, I have to say, she's officially retired from doing this, 
But if you came in in that door, you noticed that she was handing out programs. <laughs> and when the reception folks had questions, they called Sue. And when I had questions, I called Sue as early or as late as today when I said, how many programs should I be printing up? <laughs> so she has been incredibly generous with her time and we're delighted and, and grateful for her doing this. Um, she's not the only one, however. Uh, the reception has been run for years. We've always had a reception afterwards. Uh, Joy and Lown ran this for a long time, and a lot of other volunteers, uh, Deidre Mae Micker, who has been doing this, as far as I know, forever. Uh, and, and then this year, Donna Kaufman Tracy, Tracy and Mike Fenwick have taken over the, the coordination of the reception. So uh, them, and, and Deidre Mae was working on it today, too. So I would like to give them uh, a round of thanks. I, I do want to mention one of the people who has, up until this year, always worked with the reception, but is, uh, because of illness, unable to right now, and that is Christina Wardell. Uh, but she is here in spirit and would like us to know that she really cares about this event as well. Um, speaking of those who are helping but not able to be here, our sound people are all kind of doing this for the first time in a lot of ways. Uh, Randy Soden, who had been running it, fell and broke his ribs. And although he came here yesterday to help sit, to help set things up, he was directing people to what to do. And he said, I just can't sit still that long and it hurts too much. So he's at home resting where he deserves to be. However, we are developing an amazing new crew of sound folks. We've got Grant Ferris, we have uh, Rudy Knackle, and, uh, and they were here yesterday setting this thing up, crawling around here. Um, and, and we also have running around here now, Steve Woodcock, where'd you go, Steve? There he is. Um, and we're thankful for all of that. We're thankful for uh, Mary Garlow ushering. And I don't know, who am I missing? I'm missing people, but I can't think of who it is. Uh, Herb Sweet for video, uh, and a lot of other folks for being involved here. Finally, I draw your attention to the back page of the program this evening. There are four talks in this series. This is the first one, and we try to get it off, started off with a really good one so that you'll want to come back. So I just want you to be aware of some of the other, uh, the other talks that, that we're having, starting with February 6th, where we uh, feature Peter Bunton, who's the chair of the Mid-Hudson uh, Anti-Slavery History Project, and he will discuss the how music and the abolition movement worked together, in fact, how they taught that. Uh, the third talk will be on March 5th. The speaker will be Pat Weber, a lifelong Hyde Parker, um, who will just address the stone walls of Hyde Park, and in particular, their preservation in the campaign to preserve them because there was a point where they may well have been torn down. Uh, and then our last talk for the year brings back regulars Al Vink and Linda Boucher, who have given a lot of the talks here because they, they mine an endless, uh, really an endless wealth of information on the Roosevelt family. And this year they're gonna be talking about Harry Hopkins, who was FDR's fr assistant and great friend. So I hope to see you here for all of them. And now, I invite you to join us in this room in here for a reception and want to once again thank Shannon for being here, thank Sue for creating this, and thank you for being here.